Parliamo del serial killer più famoso dopo Jack lo squartatore. A breve saranno cinque anni dal massacro. Credo che molta gente non veda l'ora di sentirti parlare dopo tutto questo tempo. Voglio sapere che cosa si prova a trovarsi davanti a così tanta malvagità. So, uh, really nice to meet you. Hi. Likewise, sir. Ciao. You are the one who gave me at least uh, three nights sleepless, I think, after I see your movies, okay? But I very appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, I want to ask you, the first question I want to ask you is about uh, Art the Clown, okay? Maybe you already answered that question, but I really want to know how you create uh, this incredible character, how you choose David Norton, okay? And how is important David Norton in the, the progress, in the evolution of the character? Because I think that the kind of character change a lot with oh, the job of the, of the actor. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. David was born to play this role. Uh, in terms of creating the character, people don't realize I created this character a very long time ago, back in uh, approximately 2006. And it was for my first short film when I got out of high school because I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. I didn't have money to go to film school. So I knew I had to create a, a short film that I could submit into festivals and it could serve as sort of my calling card. Hopefully somebody could see what I could do as a filmmaker, as a special makeup effects artist. So I knew I could only make about a 10 minute movie if I was lucky. And I had to really grab that audience in 10 minutes. So I, I wanted to just pack it out with creatures and my makeup effects and gore and just characters cliche characters that i love that hopefully i could put my own little spin on them and one of them was a killer clown because i loved killer clowns and i had this idea about a clown sort of tormenting this woman on a bus in the middle of the night this is one of many ideas that i had that i thought maybe one day i could turn into something else so i thought this short film would be a perfect uh perfect thing to to incorporate that story into um and then when it came time to designing the character i wanted him to look as different from the tim curry pennywise from stephen king's it as possible because that was at the time and still is arguably the king of killer clowns so i didn't want to step on his shoes and i didn't want it to look like i was trying to uh you know steal from that character so that's why i made art the clown black and white i didn't put any color into him i didn't give him hair or like the bulbous red nose so that's where the black and white comes from uh I wanted, since I'm a makeup artist, I wanted to sculpt a prosthetic for him and not just have him be a human actor with just straight yeah. makeup. So I said, if I'm going to do that, I want him to look sort of witchy or like the devil. So I sculpted a pointed nose, pointed chin, uh, and of course, and, you know, rotten teeth, just all these sort of disgusting, off-putting things where it still looks like a human, but there's something uncanny going on. You know, you know, there's something more, uh, demonic perhaps going on with this character. Um, And, and and that was it. I mean, he didn't really have much to do. It was sort of um it was sort of just getting a taste of his personality, just that's you know, that's he was a little more stoic than he he became and a lot of potentially just creepier because he wasn't doing all these funny animated things. It was more of just the silent silent killer just looking, staring at you, you know, and uh, just honking his horn and making the character feel uncomfortable. But regardless, I mean he was in it for about four minutes. That's it. And everyone who saw that short film just kept coming up to me and saying, what is the deal with that clown? Like, he's so creepy. He looks so cool. You have to keep making more things with that character. I need to see more. Uh, and I got that note unanimously just across the board. So I said, listen, if enough people are telling me this, I think I should listen and keep going with this character. So then I decided to make another 20 minute short film with him called terrifier. I yeah. think around 2011. And uh, that's when I decided to really just go all in, in the slasher uh with the slasher element because i grew up loving the slashers those were my heroes jason freddie michael myers um and really then i started developing his darker sense of humor and injecting more of that into the into the story and he that's when it, he really clicked for me and i thought there was something special with the character and i knew i had to get this character into a feature film that became my goal from that moment on um of course the original actor was my friend mike gianelli who played art the clown 
who wasn't an actor. He was just my buddy who was at my side when I was getting into makeup effects and I would test all of my makeup gags on him if I wanted to do a bullet hit on somebody or I needed to just sculpt a, a zombie prosthetic and apply it to him. He was sort of my guinea pig. Uh, so he just sort of fell into the role of Art the Clown and did a great job. Uh, but he didn't want to continue pursuing acting. It just wasn't what he he did. So then I had to recast the role, which was very scary because the character was already working. And now I figured it could be a disaster if I put the wrong person in this costume. So in going into it now, I knew I wanted somebody taller and skinnier because I knew that that would make Art the Clown look even creepier. So we held the audition and David was probably the sixth person to come into the room. And as soon as he walked in the room, uh, there was like a light bulb. I said, immediately, he's going to look fantastic in that in that costume. I I, I hope he doesn't <laughs> blow this. And and then I gave him very little direction. He didn't have any sides or anything. He didn't really, all he knew was it was for a killer clown. I don't even think he knew the character was silent. And uh, and I told him, uh, you know, it's just a silent killer clown. Uh, and I just want to see you um, act as if you're decapitating somebody and you're doing it very gleefully. You're having a great time. And he goes, okay. And then he just flips a switch and you could actually see this audition. I think it's on my Instagram page. Uh, and he, he just seeing him transform into sort of this Jim Carrey Grinch or the mask type character as he's cutting off his head and he's so animated and theatrical. And I just, I was there with my producer, Phil Falcone. It was just the two of us in the room and we're giggling and I'm nudging him and we're just sitting back and kind of, we just kind of forget that we're auditioning somebody and we get lost in his performance and uh you know i say cut and he's laughing and you know all right we'll, we'll be in touch and he leaves and i turn to phil and i just go what else are we really looking for i mean like we should just cut the auditions now i said this guy looks amazing and he just with what he just displayed with his skills and his acting i mean it was more than i even imagined we would do with the character because originally the character was just like I said, it was just more stoic and played it straight, didn't have all that sort of flamboyant cartoon element to it. And uh, I said, let's just call him back, you know, set up an appointment where we put him put him in the prosthetic and the costume and film him doing this all over again. And that's what we did. And it was it was one of those really special kind of moments. It happens not so often, but you just know it when you see it. Like I said, I mean, he came in the room, you felt it. There was an energy, there was a magic. It was, I felt the same thing with Lauren Lavera, who plays Sienna. Mm -hmm. There was never a runner up for that character. Uh, sometimes you really just experience something magical like that. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in the, it's in the stars. It's a, it's a little bit of lightning in a bottle. So uh, I think you are doing uh, some kind of revolution, okay? Because this is a, is a project, a trilogy project, a pure slasher movie. Then from the first film to the third film is changing, okay? Is is an evolution. The first film was a, a straight slasher movie. Then in the second is writing such as a blockbuster movie, but this is an independent movie. And the third, uh, grow up, grow up, grow up again. So I want to ask you if uh, you explain yourself how this uh, become an Eastern cult, such a slasher movie, yeah. and if this trilogy, this project, is all on your mind while you are writing and directing and shooting the first movie, the second movie, okay? For sure. Well, I think hopefully, for one, I'm maturing as a, as a human and as an artist. So hopefully the work is getting better but it's maybe hopefully the storytelling is getting a little more um uh just a little more interesting a little more nuanced and complex as i go because like you said the first film was really just a showcase for art the clown and special effects um not to say that there isn't a story there um there is but it's very simplistic um but it was really just it was almost like this swing for the fences right just to say do you accept this character? Is any of this going to work for you? You know, me speaking to horror fans and, and just putting as much of that into the film as possible to leave an impression. Uh, and then if that hit, then we can start incorporating and worrying more about story and compelling characters and things like that. Um, that was my mindset anyway. But then once we got into part two, it was it was really about, okay, you've accepted this character to a degree. Now, 
we really have to start incorporating empathetic protagonists that you care about. Uh, a hero that you can get on her side, a final girl, where it really becomes her story now, her journey, uh, and and following her, and she could be the, the the character that the audience relates to on this journey, and they live sort of vicariously through that character, and uh, and also short sort of genre bending and bringing in this because I really love the fantasy genre, especially the sword and sorcery genre. So it was bringing in, see if, seeing if I could merge those two genres in some way that I'd never really seen in a slasher film before yeah. um, and exploring the supernatural. Whereas other franchises, the character dies and then he just comes back. But uh, I really wanted to explore the, the evil, the supernatural that's resurrecting, you know, how do these boogeymen come back? What is that evil that's bringing them back and driving them? They don't really touch upon that. They sort of gloss over it. So I wanted that to become not only like an element, but I wanted it to become a character in and of itself, one that actually becomes a physical character. And that's where the little pale girl came in to embody that. Um, and and then now this one is just exploring, part three is exploring that even deeper and really explaining that for the audience. Um, I think this is the most information that the audience will get out of the entire franchise so far, um, which, which they are pretty desperate for answers, especially because part two was so ambiguous and they were, mm -hmm. I threw so many ideas at them um, that we didn't explain yet. So it's nice to be able to connect a lot of those dots for the audience now and let them know what this evil is and why Sienna is a part of this uh this franchise at, at this point and what her role is in this universe so hopefully they hopefully they they gravitate toward it and they they accept it okay one last short short question uh yeah. how is you related with the italian cinema and italian horror movie if you are fan of some horror italian movie of course uh and dario argento is probably my favorite i think suspiria is my favorite italian horror movie um absolutely obsessed great with it. Film. Yeah. great film i the, the visuals the actually the um the, you'll appreciate this the um the bedroom murder scene was sort of uh in part two was yeah. sort of my oh I don't know if it was necessarily an homage, but I kept saying I want this to feel like the opening kill scene in Suspiria, where it is just absolutely relentless and it doesn't stop. Whereas, like, you know, he's stabbing the woman so many times, eventually then he's, like, stabbing. You're inside her chest and he's stabbing her heart, you know? It's just, like, just absolutely incessant, relentless. And then I told my composer, can you compose a track that kind of sounds like that track from Suspiria? And, and if you listen to it now, you'll probably be able to hear it. It sounds there's 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 quite a similarity there. So uh, Darry and and even in um, the color palette of Terrifier One, putting that sort of really bold teal color on the actors and, and in the background, that's 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 because of my love for Argento and his bold colors that he puts everywhere. So uh, huge influence uh, in the Terrifier movies because of Italian cinema. Thank you very much. I'm a very, very big fan of your trilogy. I think is is a real, real revolution. I love slash movie, slash movie, and uh, I think your is uh, the greatest new kind of slash movie now in cinema today. So I'm a really big fan. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. It means a lot. Non vedo l'ora di festeggiare il Natale più bello di sempre. Sarà pieno di divertimento, gioia e risate. 